How do you stop misinformation online? YouTube and Facebook take new steps to halt the spread of fake content. But are social media companies doing enough? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Elizabeth Piranum. Fake news is a term often in the headlines. It's a common cry from Donald Trump to discredit news stories critical of him. But the description also highlights one of the biggest challenges on the internet, how to stop the spread of misinformation online. Social media companies are under increasing pressure to stop publishing misinformation and lies. In India, YouTube's introducing alerts such as hoax and fake to flag suspicious videos. When 40 Indian soldiers were killed in an attack in Indian-administered Kashmir last month, several videos set to show the attack went viral. They turned out to be fake. YouTube is rolling out the new alerts just before Indian elections due next month and hopes for a worldwide system soon. Now, BuzzFeed is a U.S. internet media, news and entertainment company. Reporter Pranav Dixit explains why misinformation on YouTube is such a major problem in India. We are a big country, there's 1.3 billion Indians and uh, uh, so far only about 500 million Indians are online. For the last few years, they've been getting access to cheap cell phones, uh, they've been getting access to internet plans, cheap internet plans on these cell phones. And as a result, this is their window into the world and they're not able to differentiate between you know, what, what's real and what's not. Uh, and that's one of the main reasons why we have such a big misinformation problem in India. Now, Britain's upper house of parliament is calling for a digital authority to oversee government bodies in charge of safeguarding the internet. A House of Lords report says tech companies have failed to regulate themselves. Facebook is one of the companies under political pressure. On Thursday, it removed more than 130 profiles and pages, which it says were part of a UK-based misinformation network. The social media firm accused the network of setting up fake accounts to spread hate speech and divisive debate on religion, immigration and race. At least one of the fake pages had 175,000 followers. Now, Donald Trump often talks about fake news. During his election campaign in 2016, Russians were blamed for targeting U.S. voters and using Facebook to widen political and social divisions. The following year, British university researchers found accounts linked to Russia spread misinformation on four attacks in the U.K. In last year in India, at least 27 men were beaten to death when rumors on the messaging site WhatsApp wrongly accused them of being child kidnappers. WhatsApp users can no longer forward messages to more than five people or groups. Well, let's bring in our panel now. Joining us from New Delhi is Arya Thakur. She's a writer at Quartz India who covers politics and technology. In the Enskede, Netherlands via Skype, we have technology ethicist Nolan Gers. And in London, Nishant Sastri, senior lecturer at King's College London, who researches the dissemination and consumption of digital content. A very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, Ms. Thakur, I'll start with you in the Indian capital where YouTube is rolling out this new feature. How much of a difference do you think it will make to the proliferation of misinformation on YouTube in India and then beyond? I think it's definitely a good step that YouTube has taken. Um, they're rolling out these information panels that contain debunks to bits of min misinformation that are circulating on YouTube as well as elsewhere. And these are populated by fact checkers that YouTube has approved um, as you know, trustworthy sources of, of fact checks. And I think I think it's a good step, definitely, but I think some of the, um, some of the things that it won't reach are, um, are when you, videos are embedded, for instance, in WhatsApp chats mm -hmm. or circulated on other platforms. People won't be able to see these information panels. And a lot of misinformation that circulates in India um, is shared on private chat uh, apps, especially WhatsApp. And so if these information panels are only appearing on search pages, that depends, uh, that basically means that the only people who are going to be seeing them are people who are actively searching on the YouTube plat platform and not people who are receiving these videos from other, other sources as well. We will and I think that, 
broadening out, uh, I think it's definitely a good step. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. No, please continue. So I think broadening out, it's definitely a good step. Um, it's definitely a good step that this company is taking. And lots of different social media companies have rolled out individual steps towards countering misinformation. Uh, but a lot of work still definitely needs to be done um, in the next couple of months as India approaches its general election. And we will, of course, be talking about WhatsApp and what the other companies are doing in a lot of detail. But if we um, do stick with YouTube and this feature for a little bit longer, Mr. Gertz, a good first step. Is it enough? Could they be doing more? Do you think that they should... Why don't they take the videos down? Right. Well, I think that's an excellent question because at the same time, I, I agree uh, it's a good step, but at the same time, you have to ask, uh, if you label a video as hoax, does that then lead people to the assumption that anything not labeled must then be true? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So at the same time, there seems to be a concern that the framing uh, of some videos in one direction sort of implies a, a counter framing in the opposite direction. Uh, so you can imagine that when you roll out something like this, you would have to keep clear uh, that there's going to be so many more videos, uh, so much content, again, uh, as was previously discussed, shared in other format, uh, that the, the framing really has to be thought out uh, much more intricately. So I think this is uh, certainly good to keep track of uh, misinformation on YouTube, but can they do it alone and can they do it at scale? Mr. Shastri, can they do it alone and can they do it in scale? What do you think of the step? Uh, oh, yes, well, I think scale is always going to be the issue because YouTube uh, has literally become the largest platform with you know, huge numbers of videos out there, huge numbers of videos being uploaded every single day. Uh, and how are a small army of human fact checkers going to cope with that? Uh, I think this is a careful balance that needs to be drawn between being completely right, uh, which they need to do uh, so that they don't mislabel something which is not fake as fake. Uh, and then uh, also managing to catch all the fake videos that are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and the human uh, fact checker is one way of making sure that they are absolutely sure when something is labeled as fake, that it is fake, uh, or at least there's a very high degree of confidence that you know, it's been checked by professionals who are doing fact checking. But scale uh, and making sure that it works um, for all the videos is going to be a huge, yeah. huge challenge. And I really don't see a way to do it uh, without algorithmic interventions. And so, Ms. Thaka, how are these companies willing to put in the resources needed to do something like this? And also, it is a lot easier, isn't it, to fact check on YouTube, on Facebook, on Google, but not on WhatsApp, as you mentioned, which is private messages and which has been a platform that's been used for, I mean, cr uh, criminal purposes in India. Definitely. Th definitely. That's a big issue. And it's something that um, the company has the company has tried to address the misinformation issue in various ways, including by, through public education programs, um, ad campaigns, basically telling people to share joy, not rumors. But one thing they've really stood firm on is that they don't want to break end-to-end -end encryption um, because they believe that the privacy that affords it affords their users is something that uh, they're not willing to compromise. And so they com when they come to regulating content on their platform, they completely take the actual um, the issue of what that content is out of the question, and they only are cracking down on bulk messaging. So mm -hmm. if, I share, uh, if I share something with you, um, if it's misinformation, they're not going to ban my account or do anything like that. But if I'm coordinating um, multiple, like hundreds of different phone numbers to send out messages at an automated, at automated scale, basically, that's the, kind of, um, that's the kind of messaging, regardless of what the content of it is, um, that they're trying to crack down on. Um, and so that's, it's one way to sort of target uh, maybe the worst of certain aspects of politically motivated misinformation if you're talking about propaganda that's being spread out by um, political actors. But 
is it a way to exactly eradicate fake news that's being circulated on WhatsApp? That's it's certainly not. Um, I think the, the company has definitely made their stance clear on that. And when WhatsApp took the step of limiting uh, the forward feature, the number of people you could forward messages to following that spate of, you know, mob killings in India, um, and WhatsApp was used to, to spread misinformation about child kidnappers didn't turn out to be true. Did introducing this WhatsApp feature, limiting the forwarding, did that have an impact? Um, it's, it's difficult to say. Um, experts will tell you different things. I mean, some experts that I've spoken to say that uh, it really didn't feel like it made that much of a dent in it, especially because most of the misinformation and much of the misinformation problem in India is by uh, people who have a political and often a financial motivation to do it. And so uh, if political parties are paying people to circulate misinformation, they might just have to invest in a few more hands mm -hmm. to do that. Um, but it is something that it, it is something that if you're talking about people who aren't necessarily actively motivated to spread misinformation, but just might uh, otherwise have sent it to everybody in their contacts, and now they can only do it to five, it, you could see it as maybe decreasing the velocity of spreading that kind of uh, misinformation messaging. Mr. Goetz, I know that you look a lot at policies and we've just heard from, you know, Britain's parliament um, that they're calling for a digital authority and a House of Lords report saying that tech companies have failed to regulate themselves. Is a digital authority um, the answer to better regulation? Right. Well, I think there's, there's two ways to think about it. On the one hand, these companies have certainly become too big too quickly, uh, I think certainly faster than they themselves expected. Uh, and this has given them sort of an outsized uh, role in the public sphere. Uh, so you can certainly imagine why we need more steps towards uh, international and national local regulations. Uh, the mayor of Edskede at an event uh, just the other night asked me about whether they should take in a more active role in policing social media. Uh, on the other hand, though, you have to ask why people are engaging in these practices in the first place. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine thinking about things like uh, hoaxes, fake news, what we were just discussing with WhatsApp, uh, as sort of a canary in the coal mine, that maybe this is really pointing at larger political issues that are different than digital or technological issues. And that really what we need to think about isn't about uh, the role of social media in the public sphere, but what it means that social media has in many ways replaced the public sphere. Well, I mean, that's a much bigger question then, isn't it, Mr. Sastry? Now you're no longer looking at um, whether technology itself is alone to blame or it's, uh, it's humans ourselves and our own biases and what we're attracted to. Yes, I mean, so we are all known to be prone to several kinds of bias. So there is something called the confirmation bias, mm -hmm. which is basically you um, you ignore things that you don't believe in. So uh, if you are, let's say, a conservative and you see a liberal uh, viewpoint, or if you're a liberal and you see a conservative viewpoint, then you probably will discount some of the, even if, it, if there are facts, you kind of discount the facts that, that, that are being expressed in such cases. Uh, so I think the real problem as the previous speaker was saying, uh, is, is really uh, news and information as well as fake news and fake information can spread much faster uh, than it used to be able to mm -hmm. spread before. Uh, and they're being enabled by these digital platforms. And so how do we put the brakes on it so yeah. that you don't have uh, unintended consequences out of it? And, and, you know, should we demand that the news algorithms don't amplify our worst instincts, and again, is regulation at least part of the answer to doing that? The European Commission um, has been critical of Google, Facebook, Twitter, who signed up to a voluntary code of practice last September, and the commissioners are saying that, you know, they aren't living up to their responsibilities. Mr. Sastry. Yeah, so I think uh, th this is this is a very, very carefully, uh, it should be very, very carefully thought about because uh, on the one hand, uh, it, there definitely needs to be some sort of regulation or at least there seems there needs to be some sort of uh, technical slash policy interventions that need to come in because the current state of affairs uh, is not really where we want to be. 
On the other hand, if you think about the effect that these regulations will have, so let's take, for instance, the, the WhatsApp, the limiting the number of forwards. Um, so what if there was actually a tsunami going on and I needed to reach 1,000 people uh, in 10 minutes' time? Mm -hmm. uh, and the only way to do that would be to forward it to you know all all my WhatsApp contacts, and they forward it to all their WhatsApp contacts and so forth. So by limiting, by creating these technical interventions or by creating these policy interventions, you are you are also placing blocks on legitimate information which might need to spread. Um, if you are blocking down on social media, if you are blocking down on user generated content, uh, remember the whole premise, the whole excitement about user generated content was that anybody anywhere could upload anything. Yeah. Uh, and back in not you know just ten years back was the first time when you know before news journalists could yeah. upload uh, or. Uh, break a news item, others were able to break it. And you know, whistleblowers are going to be affected. Uh, the democracy as we know it uh, now, the modern democracy, the digital democracy, is not uh, going to be possible if, if, you, if you place too huge a uh, uh, regulatory uh, regime on top of uh, social media. Ms. Thakur, I could see you wanting to uh, come in earlier. Um, well, I, I just wanted to add that uh, I think I think that another big issue here, especially in the Indian context, is um, is the role of the media and the role that the media has to play mm -hmm. uh, in, in all of this. And um, I think if you see a lot of the uh, misinformation that was shared most widely, especially re recently after um, the the terrorist attack in in Kashmir and after the border conflict between India and Pakistan, a lot of misinformation um, and out of context videos were shared on news channels in, uh, in both India and Pakistan. And uh, I, think that, I, I think that that's another, uh, another type of content sure. that will be difficult for, for social media companies to sort of determine whether or not they should take down a, you know, a 10 minute clip of a news, a, a news segment that's done if it, for instance, shares, um, if it, for instance, uses an out of context bit of footage. So I think it's, it's going to be difficult calls that, that social media companies and any regulation that tries, to, um, that tries to police what type of content should be removed or not, we will have to sort of set, set difficult barriers there. And that you know, brings us back to something that Mr. Gertz was saying earlier, that you know, the flow of information, misinformation rather, it's not just uh, due to technical factors, but human too. Um, how open are those who consume false news, fake news, whatever you want to call it, to being told that it's not real, Mr. Gertz? Yeah, I think that's a very important question because you can imagine <clears throat> for many people it's, it's quite possible that they're not even really reading what they're sharing. Uh, this is why there is such a focus uh, on social media about the headline uh, that is attached. And you can see numerous uh, journalists often on social media pushing back. Uh, this has happened to me, actually. Uh, having to explain, you know, just just read the article, the headlines really not representative. Uh, so you can certainly imagine that there is something about uh, the nature of social media and the nature uh, of of human biases that sort of create this uh, sort of unholy alliance mm -hmm. where people uh, are sharing uh, without, <laughs> as cliche as that, sharing without caring really, uh, because you know you get uh, more attention, more likes. Uh, and basically every person on Facebook sort of operates like a mini Facebook, uh, sort of advertising themselves, trying to uh, package content for as many eyes as possible. Uh, so we really have to think about uh, numerous factors simultaneously at work here. Uh, and the idea that if it's just uh, people not understanding what they're sharing, I, I think that really misses the point. And how do you get, and how do you get around something like that? You know, around um, people not understanding what they're sharing, or as you call it, sharing without caring. Right. So I think again, this is uh, kind of what I was trying to say earlier that there there are larger issues at play, uh, and they're trying to sort of retroactively push back against every single uh, misuse of social media, possibly misses. Uh, sort of the social, political, cultural factors that are really motivating uh, these kind of practices in the first place. So I think uh, what really we need to think about is uh, why are people spending so much time on Facebook, on Twitter, 
Uh, why are people sharing as much as they are? Mm-hmm. Uh, are, are humans really designed, uh, Ian Bogus often, often says this on Twitter, uh, are people really meant to talk this much to each other? Mm-hmm. Uh, and really think about, uh, you know, how quickly culture has transformed and whether we've really caught up to what we're doing yet. Right. And until we, again, um, figure out and answer those actually what are much bigger questions, while we do spend so much time on social media, Mr Sastry, I'll, I'll bring this back to you. How do we regulate it in a way that is, you know, restricts misinformation, that is often turning out to be dangerous, um, having an impact on elections around the world while keeping the internet this sort of free and um, democratic and open to all ideas. Yeah, um, I think what's what's happened uh, is uh, as years have gone by, uh, the amount of information that's being thrown at us uh, is increasing exponentially. So the amount of time that each of us can spend uh, towards uh, any individual uh, piece of information decreases uh, until we now are just browsing and so we're just skipping and swiping through uh, hundreds or maybe uh, tens of hundreds of articles uh, every day and clearly we're not getting the whole picture Mm -hmm. Uh, and somehow uh, the only way that that you can get at the human aspect of this is is to um, is to change the way information is being consumed and this is again something that completely goes against the way the UI the, uh, or the um, the way in which these platforms have been designed. They've been designed for us to fall into the trap of consuming more and more information because that's how they get their money from by you know, showing us ads uh, that, that uh, correspond to uh, the articles that we are seeing. Uh, and so, so maybe the, the, at a technical level, the, the only way to change this is to change the design of the uh, social media platforms that encourages uh, slower reading, uh, more careful uh, uh, thinking, and, and more critical but will, uh, will analysis. Will tech companies uh, do that, Mr. Sastry? You know, will, will tech companies do that, especially if it's um, not the way they have made money so far? Yes. Uh, well, I guess some part of their business model might need to change. Uh, at some point, they will need to do that, uh, and you're already, you're already seeing that they are doing some of this. So the fact checking, the fact checking banner that's uh, coming out on YouTube is a, is a good example. It's a good, very initial baby step sort of example mm-hmm. uh, of of how you, you, you know you are encouraging critical thinking abilities. Okay. Right. So if you're if you're seeing. A, fake video on your, it says, think carefully about it. Yeah. Sort of like the Surgeon General's warning that says, you know, cigarettes are dangerous, uh, kind okay. of thing. Uh, we, uh, we don't have very long left in the program, and I would like to ask Ms. Thacker and uh, Mr. Gertz two very quick questions, both with the Indian elections coming up imminently, you know, the world's biggest democracy, and the European Parliament elections coming up in May. What needs to happen in both places for misinformation to not have a really negative impact on these crucial votes? Ms. Thakur, I'll start with you. You have about a minute. Yeah, I think it's it's a very difficult question, and it's important, and I think... Um, Ensuring transparency in um, in political in funding of political ads, it's something that both Google and Facebook have uh, been pretty proactive in announcing their initiatives for, mm-hmm. and so that's I think very important thing for ensuring the integrity of election related content on the platform. I think I would like to see an expansion of. Uh, at least a conversation about expanding okay. um, the understanding of what kind of content should get taken down from the platform. Okay. Um, because if, for instance, hate speech, graphic violence, and other types of speech are regulated, why maybe why not misinformation sure. if it can be used in such um, violent, potentially violent ways? Okay. Thank you very much. And Mr. Goertz, you have about 30 seconds. Misinformation uh, put forth by political entities is actually itself also information. So it also kind of gives us some insight into how certain groups uh, think about the public that they're responding to when they give them misinformation. So the uh, Facebook or YouTube or whatever, just removing the misinformation actually kind of removes the fact that these groups were trying to lie to you in the first place, which itself is information that we need. 
Mr. Goetz, thank you very much for that. And I want to thank all of our guests for this very important and fascinating discussion. It's great to get your expertise on this. That's Arya Thaka in New Delhi, Nolan Goetz in Enskede, and Nishant Sastri in London. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Elizabeth Puranam, and the whole team here, bye for now.